Welcome to Schools Not Out, your daily classroom for CSEC and CAPE students. Today's lesson is on CAPE Economics Unit 1, where we'll be focusing on the demand and supply of factors, and I am Shanique Francis. Our objectives for today include outlining the factors of production and their rewards, as well as the marginal productivity theory. We will also look at applying the marginal productivity theory for land and labor. We will also look at explaining the backward bending supply curve and also to understand some tips for answering multiple choice questions. Now, this topic is from the third module, which is a theory of distribution in your syllabus. So this is module three, topic one. Now, the theory of distribution explains how factor markets clear. It looks at how firms use factors of production which they demand for households. So the theory of distribution explains that all factors of production, which you should remember, are owned by households and are sold to firms. In return, firms will produce goods and services and sell those goods and services to households. So firms pay households for the factors of production, they produce goods for households, and households then pay the firms for the goods and services, so that there is a circular flow of income. Now the factors of production are land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. Sometimes entrepreneurship is referred to as enterprise. The factor rewards include rent, wages, interest, and profit. So for the factor of production land, the reward is rent. For the factor of production capital, the reward is interest. For the factor of production wages, the reward is Sorry, for the factor of production labor, the reward is wages. So it simply means that someone who supplies their labor is paid wages. Now, factor markets and product markets. Now, market prices for goods and services are determined by the forces of demand and supply. So this is how we determine the price for any good that you purchase. The forces of demand and supply, which we explored in an earlier lesson. Now, the factor prices or the rewards for the factors of production are also determined by the demand and supply of those factors. So factors of production are demanded only as inputs in the production process. So if they are demanded only as input in the production process, the demand for these factors can be called a dash demand. Do you remember what type of demand that is? So is it A, desired demand, B, derived demand, C, important demand, or D, artificial demand? We'll come back to that later. Now, we want to look at the importance of the marginal productivity theory. So the theory is instrumental in analyzing the factor markets and the input side of short run production. Please remember, it looks at short-run production. It helps to explain the demand for factors based on the idea that any firm that is trying to maximize their profit will hire more inputs, but this is dependent on the comparison between the productivity of the input and the cost of the input. And when we say productivity, we simply mean how much output will that input produce? How effective or efficient will it be for the firm? So there are some assumptions of the marginal productivity theory which helps us to get a better understanding. And we want to look at those basic assumptions. So the first one is that the firm has at least one fixed factor of production. And you, if you remember in the previous slide, I highlighted the short run. And we know that in the short run, there's at least one factor of production which is fixed. So we know that the firm has at least one fixed factor because it looks at the short run. It is also because of this why the firm is subject to the law of diminishing returns. Now, the law of diminishing returns, if you remember what your teacher taught you, is simply stating that as additional units of variable factors are added to a fixed factor, 
eventually the marginal product of the variable factor will decrease. So what is this saying? So say for instance, you have a business and your fixed factor is capital or your machinery and your variable factor is your labor. So the number of persons you employ. So if you have a business and you are manufacturing cupcakes and so you have a large machine that bakes or a large oven and that's your machine. Now, if you have one oven, one industrial oven that helps you to produce cupcakes and you have one worker, that one worker may be able to produce 50 cupcakes. If you continue to add more and more workers and you do not increase your stock, your capital stock, meaning you still have the one oven, eventually the workers will get into each other's way and subsequent workers will not be as productive. So also another assumption is that the firm is a price taker and the firm is a price taker in the labor market because it's a perfectly competitive market. All right, so question if you are paying attention. If factor prices are determined by the forces of demand and supply, how does a firm determine its demand for a factor? When will it know or how will it know to demand more factors? So according to the MPT, that's Marginal Productivity Theory for short, the demand for a factor of production is based on the marginal product of the factor. What does marginal product mean? Now the marginal product is also referred to as a marginal physical product. So it simply looks at, in the case where we're looking at the variable factor to be labor, the marginal physical product of labor is any extra output produced by an additional worker. So if you have one worker at your place of business or your first worker produces 50 cupcakes, the marginal product for that first worker is 50. If you hire a second worker and that second worker brings your total production to 110, you will know that the marginal product of the second worker is 60 because previously your total product was 50 with a one worker. Then when you hire the second worker, it's 110. So the second worker produced 60 cupcakes. Okay, so fill in the blank quickly. People are employed because of the value of their what do you think goes there? Is it the value of their pretty looks, their personality? Let us see what the next slide says. So people are employed because of the value of their output. So it's not about, you know, how well you look, how well you dress, but it's actually for the business that's trying to make a profit. How much output can you produce? Because at the end of the day, the output that you produce for the business will be sold and that will bring them revenue when they sell the products. So that's what the business is looking at. So a business is usually willing to pay a higher price for an output, for an input that is more productive and contributes more to, to output. So the business will pay higher wages to a worker if the worker is more productive and will produce more output because the worker who produces more output will bring more revenues to the firm. So MPP and MRP. So MPP, as I mentioned before, is marginal physical product. And the MRP is the marginal revenue product. Now in calculating MRP, you would multiply the MPP by the MR, the marginal revenue. The marginal revenue is also price. Now you would have explored these concepts in module two. So the marginal revenue product is downward sloping because of the law of diminishing returns and the marginal physical product also slopes downwards. Now we are looking at the marginal revenue for a perfectly competitive firm. So usually in an imperfect market, meaning a monopoly, the the, ma the marginal revenue curve slopes downwards. So if a firm that's in a monopoly or operating as a monopoly wants to sell more goods and services, they have to lower their prices. But in a perfectly competitive market, no individual firm controls the market. Therefore, they have to keep the price set by the market. And that's for the goods and services market. The same idea applies for a perfectly competitive market for labor. So if there's a perfectly competitive market, the wage rate will remain the same. And also 
the marginal revenue will remain the same because the firm has no control over the price of the good. So the firm has to use whatever price that the market is working with. So the marginal revenue product, I completed this table for you. So looking at this table, we can see the different units of labor, one, two, three, four, five to six. And it looks also at the total product that is produced and the marginal product and the price. So we see that price remains constant. So it means then that the previous slide is true where price is fixed at $5. It doesn't matter how many units of good the firm produces or how many units of labor it employs. So when using the formula that we just mentioned MRP times price, we can calculate the marginal revenue product. And that's really telling you the value of what each additional worker is producing. So we'll notice that when the first worker is employed, the MPP is 12, all other workers will have a diminishing marginal return. So the MPP decreases and we notice that the MRP also decreases. So as I mentioned before, the marginal physical product of labor curve is downward sloping and also the marginal revenue product of labor. So how do firms determine the amount of labor input that they employ with a downward sloping MRP curve and a downward sloping MPP curve? Now, to determine the number of units of labor to employ, a firm will compare the MRP, which is the marginal revenue product, to the marginal resource cost. If you remember market structures or unit two, you'll remember that the profit maximizing firm produces where the marginal revenue is equal to the marginal cost. So this is the same idea. So the firm is gonna compare the marginal revenue product. Why? The marginal revenue product is the value that the additional worker brings to your firm and also the cost of the input. And the cost of the input, I mentioned wages earlier, is what you will pay to the worker. So the firm in this case is gonna compare MRP with wages. So if the firm, if the MRP is greater or equal to the MRC, which is the marginal resource cost, then the firm should employ the additional worker. So if we should go back to this table, the firm is going to compare the, MP, the MRP to the wage. I have not told you what the wage is as yet. So let us move on. So remember, the firm compares marginal revenue product with marginal resource cost to determine how many units of labor to employ. How do firms determine the amount of labor input to employ? If in this case, the wage rate is $20. So let us look back at this table. If the wage rate is $20 and the firm is making a comparison between marginal revenue product and this should be marginal revenue product in the last column. If the firm is comparing marginal revenue product where we see it goes from 60 to 50, 30, 20 and 10 and the marginal resource cost, which is $20, how many units of labor will the firm employ? Remember, the MRP should be equal to the MRC. The MRC should not be greater than the MRP. So to answer your question, so compare the MRP to wage rate, which I mentioned. So employing the first unit of labor increases the revenue by $60 and increases the cost by only $20. So when you hire the first unit of labor, you're paying $20 to that worker. The first worker will bring $60 in revenue to your firm. When you hire the second worker, looking back at this table, the second worker brings $50 and you're paying the second worker $20 also. So the firm is continuously making a comparison between the marginal revenue product and the marginal resource cost, which is wages. So the first unit of labor, notice in the last column, marginal revenue product is 60. You pay $20 to the worker. When you hire the second unit of labor, 
MRP is 50, you're paying $20 to the worker. So the cost for labor is less than the value that the worker is actually taking to you. So the firm will continue up to the fifth unit of labor because that worker will bring in $20. If the firm should hire the sixth unit of labor, it means that the worker will only take $10 to the firm in terms of what they're going to produce. So if the firm, if that worker produces and the value that they're taking to the firm is only $10 and the firm has to pay them $20, essentially the firm is losing. So it makes sense to hire no more than five workers. So in the goods market, profits are maximized. Just as a reminder, where the marginal cost of an extra unit of good produced is equal to the marginal revenue from selling it. In the labor market, the firm tries to equate the marginal cost of labor with the marginal revenue of labor. All right, so notice graphically, we will see I made a change to this table where the first worker would have brought in 60 and the second worker would have brought in, in terms of marginal revenue products, the second worker would have brought in 70. Notice that after the second worker, the law of diminishing marginal return sets in. So each worker after the second worker brings in less marginal revenue for the firm. So initially it increased from 60 to 70 and then it started to decline. So this is why the shape of the marginal revenue product curve is it goes up and then it starts to slope downward. And we notice that the wage rate is fixed and Graphically, we can also make a determination as it relates to the number of units that the firm employs. We see where the marginal revenue product curve crosses the marginal cost or the wage rate at five units or five units of labor. So this is just confirmation about what we said before. So we can see graphically or we can work it out in the table. So if the worker adds more to the firm's revenue than its cost, the firm will increase the firm's profit will increase and it's worth having that worker. All right, so I want to look at the supply for labor. Now, the supply for labor is represented by the sum of individual supply. So that's the market supply of labor. So workers get satisfaction from wages. In this instance, we're looking at only wages. Some workers do get satisfaction from doing their actual work. So we're looking at it from the standpoint that workers get satisfaction from their wages and the utility is the same as the wages. So this is because the workers can either choose to work or do leisure activities. So in this theory, the supply curve is upward sloping. Now the demand for land. So the demand for land is the firm makes a determination about how much land to demand in a similar way as the demand for labor. So again, the firm is going to make a comparison. So the marginal product of land is equal to the change in output divided by the change in land. So it looks at how much additional, additional output the firm will produce from having an extra unit or extra piece of land. And the value of the marginal product is calculated in the same way as it is for labor. So the price of the product multiplied by the marginal product of land. The difference with the demand, the supply for land rather, is that the supply for land is generally considered to be fixed. So when the firm is looking at the demand, similar to how it makes a determination for labor where it compares the MRP to the marginal resource cost, the firm will compare the value of the marginal product of land so the price of land. So because the supply of land is generally considered to be fixed, this makes it a little different from the supply of labor curve, which is upward sloping. And we know that land includes all the natural resources and we can't go and create more natural resources. So that's why it's generally considered to be fixed. However, technology can improve how much output we get from land. So if you consider a country like Trinidad that produces oil, if they have more advanced technology, they can be able to extract more oil or discover more oil reserves so that they can produce more. That's the only way because that's a natural product. 
So the limitations of the marginal productivity theory. So the marginal productivity theory simplifies things for us to understand, but it does have some limitation. So one of the limitations is that it is virtually impossible to know beforehand the marginal physical product of service workers, right? So workers who are not actually producing goods, how do you know beforehand how productive those workers will be, right? Or other members of staff, so for a business that has administrative staff, how do you calculate the marginal revenue product of those workers to know if it's worthwhile for you to employ more of those workers? So the MRP theory also assumes that the other factors of production will remain unchanged and what varies is labor. Now some firms actually use capital in place of labor. So this will be more difficult to make a determination as it relates to measuring the MPP and the MRP because firms might not be hiring more workers, they might just be using more machines. Limitations continued. So it assumes a perfect labor market, when in reality we know that the labor market is not perfect, it's subject to imperfections. So the labor market, there is no freedom of entry and exit and there is also labor immobility. And if you recall, labor immobility can be categorized in two ways. There is occupational mobility and there's geographical mobility. So because of occupational mo mobility, someone who is employed as a doctor cannot just get up tomorrow and say, okay, I think I want to be a mechanic. I'm going to go to a firm that um, does motor vehicle repairs or engineers because they didn't study for that. So there is immobility in that sense. And then there's also geographical immobility. It's not a case where people can just leave one country and go to the other and just continue their profession as they were without restrictions, unless there is some agreement between those countries that labor can move around freely. Also, another limitation of this theory is the backward bending supply curve. Now, the backward bending supply curve does not go in accordance with what this theory says. So according to the backward bending supply curve, at higher wage rates, workers typically choose to work less hours. Remember I mentioned before that according to, the, to this theory, the supply curve slopes upwards just like a regular supply curve. So as wages increase, according to the MPT theory, workers are more willing to work. But in reality, there's a backward bending supply curve. Why? A worker is going to consider the fact that if, say for instance, you're working for five hours at your job, your goal for the week is to work $10,000. Right, And if you're working for five hours at your job and your goal is to work $10,000, right, you'll make that goal if your wage rate is $200. Now, what if the wage rate doubles or triples? You don't need to work five hours to make your goal. You can work less hours. You can choose to continue to work more hours if you want money if you want additional money, but what if you don't want more money? You just want the set goal that you have in mind. So if you are paid a higher wage rate, you don't work more hours, you work less hours because you will make that amount of money in less time. So that is why the supply curve is backward bending because workers will make a determination to use the additional hours that they would have worked to do some leisure activities, spend more family time, get in some more exercise. They don't need to work as hard at higher wage rates. Now, we want to look at some tips for answering multiple choice questions. And these tips are important because as you know, for those preparing for CXC, that is the Cape and CSEC exams, there is a proposal to change it to a, a multiple choice or to focus more on multiple choice questions and your SBAs. So if we are going to move forward with this multiple choice question, just try to develop a strategy that will be effective for you. So first of all, when you're doing multiple choice questions, it's good to answer the questions first in your mind. Before you write anything on the paper, read the question and see if you can figure out the answer first in your mind, especially if it's not a question where you have to actually calculate anything. 
So think about the question, read the question carefully, consider the options A, B, C, D, E, and say, okay, you know, what do I think the answer for this question is? Next, you're gonna eliminate the wrong answers. When you're eliminating the wrong answers, you're removing your distractions. So you're taking away things that are definitely not correct. Your next step or next thing to consider is what is the best option? So maybe when you are reviewing your multiple choice questions, there's at least one or two responses that you know it's definitely not this. So you remove those two and you're left with the distractor and the correct answer. So you're gonna select the best option from those four or the better option from the two. Read every single option. So don't just read the question and say, okay, read the first option and you think that I know the answer, it's this one, let me select it. Make sure to read every single option. Sometimes the questions are designed for critical thinking and it just might be tricky and throw you off. So try to read all questions. So don't get thrown off by that. If you are answering questions, try to answer the questions that you know first. So if you are struggling with any question, just move on and then you will come back to that question. And then make sure, and this is absolutely important because I see students do this all the time, they leave multiple choice questions unanswered. Make sure you answer every single question. And you, if you meet up on a question where you have absolutely no idea what the answer is, choose an answer. Because if you think you don't know the answer, then it, you won't lose by choosing any response. So just choose an answer. Do not leave any question unanswered. Pay attention to words that says not always, never, sometimes. And sometimes they have those words in bold and or they're capitalized and sometimes we look over them. So pay attention to those words. Now, earlier in this segment, I asked a question and I want to go back to that question and provide a response now, which I'm sure we know. So this was a multiple choice question. It says, since factors of production are demanded only as inputs in the production process, the demand for factors is a dash demand. And we covered this in our very first lesson. So the demand for the factor is a derived demand. The firm doesn't want the worker. They don't want land. They don't want it for those specific purpose of just having them. It's a derived demand because they're only needed as inputs in the production process. So the firm actually needs those resources to produce. So please remember that factors of production are demanded only as inputs in the production process. You should also take some time to get access to your CAPE syllabus. So visit the CXC website, download your syllabus and you'll find some specimen questions in the syllabus. You'll find paper two specimen questions and you'll also find multiple choice specimen questions. And it's very important that you do this because the answers are also there. Go through the syllabus and also look at the report and see what challenges different students or candidates over the years have had with questions and this will help you tremendously. You can also look online for websites that have different multiple choice questions and try to work out those questions, getting as much practice as you can before your examination. Now, in this recap segment, we want to look at some questions based on what we have explored so far. So, I have a few multiple choice questions for you to look at. And I'll pause to give you just a little bit of time to think about the questions and what your response would be. So the formula to calculate the value of marginal product is, so how do we determine the value of the marginal product? That is the output produced by the additional worker or the marginal revenue product. So you might see the question you might see a question asking about the value of the marginal product or the marginal revenue product. The concept is the same. So how do we derive that answer? So using the tips that we learned before, while you're there contemplating what the correct answer is, if you haven't determined it as yet, 
I want you to just look at which response you think it's definitely not it. So begin to eliminate the responses that you think are not correct. Or at least one response that you think is not correct. And then try to look for the response which is the best response. Avoid using your notebooks, textbooks, or any other resources so that you can actually challenge yourself to see how much you remember. So for this response, it says A, the marginal physical product divided by the average physical product. Is it B, total cost divided by marginal products? Is it MPP, or marginal physical product, multiplied by the price? Is it fixed cost plus variable cost? Which do you think is the best answer? All right, so I'm hearing you and you're, you're thinking that the correct answer is actually there and the correct answer is C. So it's the marginal physical product multiplied by the price. So you look at the marginal product that the worker produces and you're also going to look at the price of the product. You find the product of those two figures and then that will determine how much they have produced for the firm or the value of how much they have produced for the firm. Next question. When labor is used, the marginal physical product of labor increases. So is this true? Do you recall what the table that we were looking at before, what it looks like? Did you observe a pattern where the MPP was increasing as we employed more workers? Is this question true? Is the correct response true or is it false? So if the MPP was increasing in the table, then it means that the response is true. If the MPP was decreasing, it means that the correct response is false. So the correct response is false because of the law of diminishing marginal returns. We know that the MPP will decrease over time. Next question. A profit maximizing firm will hire labor input until dash is equal to dash. So what two things need to be equal? So the first response is marginal revenue, marginal cost, long run marginal revenue, long run marginal cost, labor output ratio or capital output ratio, marginal cost of labor and marginal revenue product. Now, using the strategy that we learned before, we can definitely eliminate B. And if you recall, the theory looks at production in the short run. So it definitely could not be long run marginal revenue and long run marginal cost. So the correct answer is the marginal cost of labor, which we discussed before, and also the marginal revenue product. So the correct option is D. Next question for you to think about. The downward sloping marginal physical products of labor is the firm's dash. So is the downward sloping MPP curve the firm's supply of labor curve? Is it the short run demand curve for labor? Is it the marginal cost of labor curve? Or is it the marginal revenue product curve? So for a firm, the marginal revenue product curve is also the demand curve. Next question that we're going to work out on the board. Want to calculate the marginal physical product, if you remember. So we find marginal physical product by looking at the change in output. So in this column, we have labor input. So it's the same table that you just saw. So we have labor employed. So we have zero units of labor, one, two, three, four, five, six. The first unit of labor produces 25. Then the second produces 60. The third produces 120. The fifth unit of labor produces 100. And, sorry, this is total output, right? So let me add that not to confuse you or myself anymore. So after you employ the first worker, total output is 25. When you hire the second worker, total output is 60. Hiring the third worker gives you a total output of 120 units. Hiring the fourth worker gives you 150 units. 
the fifth worker, you will produce 178 units, and the sixth worker, you will produce 185 units. Now, how do we derive the marginal physical product? So it's usually the change in total product divided by, divided by change in the quantity of the variable output. So in this case, we notice that the variable input changes by one. So it's change in out, total output divided by change in input of the variable factor. And input is always changing by one. So we don't have to use the formula where we divide by the change in output because any number divided by one will be the number itself. So we can just look at the change in output. So the difference between the second and first unit is, or rather the difference between the zero units and the first unit would be 25. And then we move on to the second unit of labor and the difference between the second unit of labor and the first unit of labor is 40. So 40 plus 25 will give you, no. So it's 35, so 35 plus 25 will give you 60. And then the difference between the third unit of labor and the second unit of labor is 60. The difference between the fourth unit of labor and the third is 30. So the fourth worker brought in an additional 30 units. The difference between the fifth unit of labor and the fourth is 38 units, are we looking? No, it's actually 28 units. So if you're paying attention, you'd have got that. And the difference between the sixth unit of labor and the fifth unit of labor is 20. Is that correct? No. So again, if you're paying attention, you'll notice that the difference is seven. So we notice the MPP increases between the first and second unit of labor and then it also increases again between the second and third unit of labor and from there it starts to decline. All right, so I have some more questions for you to consider. So do you remember what the assumptions of the marginal productivity theory are? So one assumption is that the firm has at least one fixed factor and this is because the firm is operating in the short run. And because of this, it is subject to the law of diminishing returns. Do you remember the other assumption? I hope you took the time to write down some of these, some of the information shared with you. Also, the firm is a price maker. So this means that the firm does not determine the price of the, the factors or the, the price of the, the goods that they're selling. They have to work with whatever price the market determines. And for that reason, the marginal revenue product will remain constant because, because price does not change because this is a perfectly competitive market. In addition, do you remember any limitations of the theory? Why is it that some of the things in the theory might not actually apply in reality? Now, one of the limitation is looking at the supply curve. So it assumes that the supply curve is upward sloping. And if you recall, we looked at the backward bending supply curve, which says that as workers continue to have an increase in their wage rate, they have the option and they most likely choose the option to work less hours because less work can bring them the same or even a greater amount of pay. So they have more time for leisure activities. Can you explain the concept of the backward bending supply curve? I just did that one for you. So one more limitation I want us to look at is it assumes that the perfect, it assumes the perfect labor market and this is not true. And we know that this whole concept of a perfectly competitive market is purely theoretical, does not exist in the real world. And just to look at the other assumptions as well, again, it is virtually impossible to know beforehand what the marginal physical product for service workers will be or other members of staff who are not producing physical output. So if they're just rendering a service to your business, how do you determine MPP in order to determine if you should hire more of those workers or not. In addition, the theory assumes that the production will remain unchanged while labor varies. And as mentioned, businesses do substitute capital 
for labor. All right, so this is the end of our lesson for today. And I really hope that you would have learned something to help your preparation for your external exam. So that's all today for Cape Economics Unit 1. I hope you grasped some of the points that we discussed. So until next time, I'm Shanique Francis. Mm -hmm.